All right, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to Stratford Hall's program tonight. We're gonna to be talking about Caesar's Kitchen and particularly chocolate tonight with celebrity chef, Chris Scott and our resident chef here at Stratford, Dontavius Williams. My name is Dr. Kelly Fonto Dietz. I'm the vice president of collections and public engagement here at Stratford Hall in Stratford, Virginia. We've been doing these programs now, Don, for several years. I think you're a seasoned vet for these cooking demo Zoom programs. You are a favorite online. And we have the, the wonderful opportunity to have Chris Scott join us last week. And I've known you, Chris, now for several years. And you got to come to Stratford. So what was that like? You know, it was it was truly special. You know, um, I mean, you guys kind of told me in, in advance that it was going to be an experience. And it absolutely was, you know, just being there, you know, where everything happened and so much rich history behind everything and Dontavius is a gem, you know, for sure. And I'm so glad that we connected, you know, and it's, 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 it's rare when you meet someone that you truly just gel with right away and, and that happened, you know, so me and Dontavius after this, we're going out to the club. So <laughs> it's going to be a good old time. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was it was amazing uh, having you on site, Chris. And I mean, Dontavius, you always work magic here, but there was an energy there uh, between the two of you that you all viewers are going to witness in some of these videos tonight that we're going to show you. So a little bit about the site for you first time uh, Zoomers on this program. Stratford Hall was established in 1738 by a man named Thomas Lee and Caesar, who we're honoring tonight and who we continue to commemorate through these programs, was an enslaved chef here at Stratford Hall um, during the middle part of the 18th century. He was also one of three people making chocolate in the colony. And because of that, we get wonderful funding and support for our programs from Mars Wrigley, a chocolate company and their American Heritage chocolate line. So we are able to honor him, commemorate him to the work that Dontavius does in his honor. And, you know, Dontavius, you cook a lot of stuff, but we do always return back to chocolate. So one yeah. of those things, right? Yeah, even tonight at home. Yeah, well, I'll talk about that later. Okay, awesome. All right, yeah. so... So go ahead and kick this off. And for those of you that are new to our programs, we are going to show tonight not just one video, but two videos. They were so fantastic. And I want to give a shout out as well to Blackwater Branding out of Lynchburg, who did the, uh, the videography for this. They were wonderful to work with. We're going to go ahead and play back-to-back -back cooking demos. So you are going to first see Don Tavius, our resident chef here at Stratford, make a chocolate tart, correct? Yes. Okay, I was like, it's a tort or tart? And then we're going to see Chris make magic. I don't even want to tell you what it is. You're just going to watch it. And if you could have eaten it, you would be very, very jealous um, of all of us now who were able to taste it. That made no sense. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get this started. So bear with us. I'm going to play these videos. Also, it's your first time zooming in. We do not have the chat open. It drives all of us crazy. So if you have a question for us, just go ahead and pop it in the Q&A in the bottom. We will get to it after we play the videos. So again, welcome you all. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation tonight. I'm excited to show everyone the work that you all did last week and the beauty that you produced. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Give cool. me one moment. Shout out to Miss Bonita. I see Miss Bonita on here, Kelly. Awesome. Hello. All right. Help if I. All right. Okay. Are we ready? Pretty excited. All right. So the first video, they're each about 15 minutes long. So for the next 30 minutes, you are going to be deeply engrossed with these wonderful videos of Chris and Dontavius doing chocolate magic at Stratford Hall. Good day, this is Dontavius Williams again, resident historic interpreter here at Stratford Hall in Montrose, Virginia. I am so happy to join you again this evening for another conversation about chocolate. Last time I was with you, I believe two Christmases ago, we made some sipping chocolate. Now, while chocolate was not consumed primarily as a dessert, 
chocolate was actually consumed more as a drink in the 18th century and typically during breakfast times. Today, though, we're focusing in on a receipt called a chocolate tart another way. Um, the recipe is based from a historic receipt from 1737, and which was later interpreted by Hannah Glass in her cookbook, uh, The Complete Confectionary in 1800. Today's receipt that you will see is another adaptation of that original receipt. This is my recipe that I have actually pulled together uh, to be able to make it in a nuanced way, just a little bit differently. Now, before we get into this, of course, you guys know I'm going to have to talk about the reason why I'm here today. And the reason why I'm here today is to honor and to talk about and celebrate the life of Caesar. Caesar, of course, was the enslaved chef here at his, at, at Stratford Hall. And he actually came here and was taught, we believe, by an Englishman who was actually indentured by the name of Richard Minot. Once Richard Minot left Stratford Hall, it was Caesar's responsibility to run this kitchen. Caesar had to work late into the night, waking up early into the mornings to ensure that this family had everything that they wanted, desired, or or even could think about. Uh, he had to kind of think things through and manage this kitchen by himself. Now, he didn't do all the cooking himself. He had a team. Uh, I, it's been said that Caesar maybe orchestrated this kitchen as a conductor would a particular orchestra. It was a hard job, but someone had to do it. Chocolate making was a process and it was a skill that not many people had. In the colonies, there were only three chocolate stones and Stratford Hall was the home of one of those chocolate stones. And at the helm of the ship of chocolate making here was Caesar. Caesar was responsible for ensuring that all of the confectionery treats and all of the cuisine was actually taken care of and, and shared with this family and their invited guests. Now, it's almost Christmas time here, but this is a time that we pause to understand while we are celebrating now in the 21st century. And while they were celebrating in the big house in the 18th century, Caesar was working. This was a time wherein those who worked in these skilled positions actually didn't see their families much at all if ever. Um, today, we're going to focus in on a receipt uh, called Chocolate Tart Another Way. A Chocolate Tart Another Way. Another way, you may ask, what does that mean? Well, it means it's my way. The original receipt or recipe comes from the 1737 book, The Whole Duty of a Woman, which inspired Hannah Glass in 1800 to make her version of a chocolate tart um, in the 1800s in her book, uh, The Complete Confectionery. Well, today in 2023, it's my turn. This is a chocolate tart, another way, Dontavius's way. Let's jump right in. So we have our ingredients here. We have a quarter cup of chocolate. Now we have some very special chocolate here. This is the American Heritage blend of chocolate. The American Heritage blend is flavored with lots of spices and uh, citrus notes. It's so delicious and it mixes so well as a sipping chocolate or even in your baking chocolates. So we have a quarter cup of baking chocolate here from American Heritage. We have a quarter cup of flour. This is just plain wheat flour. Uh, and then we have one cup of sugar that we're going to mix all together with two eggs and the secret ingredient, vanilla flavoring. Let's jump right in. All right, let's build this pie. First things first, we want to beat two eggs and set those aside. So. I'm just going to do these really quickly. 
That's number one. All right, now that we have our eggs beaten and set to the side, let's pull together the chocolate and the flour. So it's really simple. We'll start with the, the flour here. Again, this is one quarter cup of flour that we're gonna to add to the bowl. I wanna get all of it. one quarter cup of the American Heritage chocolate. This is the star of the show, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so what we wanna do is we wanna get the chocolate and the flour incorporated together. So we'll mix it all together. Again, as I said, this American Heritage chocolate is very, very flavorful. Um, it has some citrus notes in it, and of course, um, other spices. It's so delicious, um, and it's in the in the same style as that historic chocolate uh, that was consumed in the 18th century. All right, so we got that all mixed up. We're going to add the sugar. This is one cup of granulated sugar. As I was pouring the, the recipe up, I was like, gee whiz, that's a lot of sugar. But it's the holiday season. These are special times. And again, chocolate was not necessarily used as a dessert often. So I guess whenever you can, you will. And sugar was expensive. This Lee family was, as I often say, very, very rich. Um, and so the access to these resources uh, was possible uh, from this family. But you know, it's crazy that Caesar had the access to these uh, resources for the family, but not for himself. That's the thing about um, living during a time in which um, slavery existed, those opportunities weren't there for everyone. So there you have it. You see everything is all mixed up. Now this is the next part. We're gonna add some eggs to it. We're gonna add the eggs and then finally, one stick of melted butter. So let's pour our eggs. Now, sometimes chocolate has a hard time of mixing with liquid. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily want to want to mix well um, at first, but it'll be okay. We're going to make it work. That's those two eggs, a quarter cup of, uh, of chocolate, quarter cup of flour, and then let's see here we. Got it going. It takes time to get it. That chocolate does not want to do right sometimes. So you have to make it do right. All right, see there? It's all incorporated. Next, I have to go and get the, the butter from the oven because it's kind of cold in here and it wouldn't be melted. But before we do that, let's go ahead and add this vanilla. It's a teaspoon of vanilla, so we're going to kind of eyeball it. There we go. All right, I'm going to stir this up, and then we'll be right back with the butter. Let's add this butter to the to the mixture here 
Again, this is one stick of butter. Butter makes everything better. All right, so let's stir this guy up. So this is gonna be kind of cakey, kind of fudgy-like whenever you have it. The chocolate tart that was in the 1737 book, it's more of an egg pie, an egg custard, if you will. Um, but they bake about the same time. It takes about 40 to 45 minutes to bake these things. But once you bake it, you let it set up, and then you serve it. Cool. All right, so this is the consistency you see there. Now, we're going to fill our pie tin all out. not going to do this like my grandma does it. My grandmother, she leaves nothing in the bowl. She makes cakes at home. What we're going to do, we'll do that. And then we're going to spread it evenly in the pie tin or the tart tin. And bake it in a 350 degree oven. We're going to bake this off in the 1730s uh, brick oven here at Stratford Hall in this original oven. So you want to bake it until it is done. And again, like I said, that's about 45 minutes. I'm going to give it time. All right, let's see. There's your tart. We're gonna bake it in this 45, in this 350 degree oven. There we have it, a chocolate tart, another way. Chocolate tart, Dontavious's way. This particular tart that I made actually will put you in the mind of maybe a chocolate chess pie, or if you will, um, the way that I did it today. But again, like I said, in the 18th century, just like today, receipts and recipes were shared and they changed. Recipes aside, chocolate aside, the reason why I'm here again is to not only talk about the chocolate and the importance of it to the American cuisine, but to the contributions and the sacrifices made by those who were enslaved just like Caesar. I am here because they were here. And my responsibility moving forward is to continue to amplify their voices and their stories. As you go through the rest of this year, and moving forward, take time to learn something about Caesar or any of these people who made sacrifices for all of our liberties today. Thank you. Give me one second when I reload the other video.
Kelly, while you're doing that, I just want to, you know, tease the people with a little uh, slice of. I want to eat it again. It was let so good. Them, let them eat tart. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> now, how are you going to bring grub to the party? Thank you. you. That's wrong. You tell me, man, see? Oh, man. <laughs> and it's so good. This cat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, video number two. I'm drooling over here. All right. And here we go with uh, Chris Scott and Don Tavius together. One of my favorite moments in life has been watching the two of you interact. All right, here we go. Oh, this was so fun. Welcome to Stratford Hall. We have a very special guest here in that of Mr. Chris Scott. Hey, Chris, how's it going, man? Hey, Chef, how are you, brother? I'm doing well. Thank Great. you so much. Welcome to Caesar's Kitchen. Thank you. You've got a wonderful setup here, and I'm excited to see what it is that you have to do today. So yeah. I'm going to let you just take over. Did you ever see that show on MTV back in the day, MTV Unplugged, where they would bring all these great, like, Stevie Wonder and Maxwell and like everybody, but they would take away all the electronics oh, yeah. and all the gadgets and they would just have to do their thing. This is what this is going to be like for, for me, but I'm so glad to be here mm -hmm. because this is a dish I've done many, many times, mm -hmm. but never like this. We'll separate the men from the boys today. Right? We'll see that. All yes. Right. Yeah. We'll, <laughs> we'll see exactly where I fit in. Got you. What you making? So this is more to amplify the flavors of the chocolate. Mm -hmm. And I have here, I want you to try this. This is called Eru. And basically what it is, it's a Nigerian locust bean. I was going to say it looks like a bean. Mm -hmm. Very similar to like the Chinese fermented black bean as far as taste is concerned, right? So what they do, they take the locust bean and they boil it, they shell it, they husk it, mm -hmm. you know, and then they ferment it with calabash, mm -hmm. the, the plant. They dry it out just like so. So what they use this to make iguzi soup, you know, a lot of snapper dishes, has that savory kind of funkiness, that fermentation kind of taste to it. Mm -hmm. and, and I thought, you know what? I want to do this with chocolate. It tastes like chocolate. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So we're going to ferment that. We're going to put this, 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 this into the uh, chocolate, I'm basically going to temper that, mm -hmm. the chocolate and butter technique, very old school. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to kind of infuse this flavor into it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to chop this up. But in the meantime, I got something for you to do. I got some sugar and I got some eggs. And I heard that you got this very new school or old school kind of whisk that's made from branches that I would love to see that technique on this okay. right here. And I'm going to pass that off to you. So in here, I got the sugar and I got the eggs. And you're going to whisk that up almost into a very, very deep ribbon. Okay. Check, check this out. Birch branch. Word. 1850. <laughs> All right, let's do this. And you said just like a ribbon? Just like a ribbon, okay. exactly. Right. And then in this, I'm going to temper the, the uh, chocolate with the butter, and then I'm gonna chop up this iru and put that right inside of it. I love this kitchen, man. Can you tell me some history about this room? So this is a 1730s kitchen. Um, gentleman that worked in this kitchen for some was um, Caesar. Mm. Uh, he was enslaved here at Striper Hall, but he actually, um, early on in his, in his time here, was actually taught by an indentured servant by the name of Richard Minot, um, we believe. And so um, once Richard Minot left here, Caesar took control of this space and had to operate this space like a uh, conductor would do it in the orchestra. Oh, wow. It was a busy place, man. There was a lot going on. I believe it. I just took a tour 
of the big house and I actually saw all the rooms where the entertaining must have went down, you know? Mm -hmm. And because we know food plays a very important part of that, that must have been, I mean, in here must have been a circus. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you see how clean this floor is? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you work at restaurants, so you know how kids oh, Believe me, man, I do. And it's December right now, but I could only imagine in the heat of July, what this place must feel like. It's torturous. <laughs> <laughs> but the work continued, you know, he had a job to do. That's right. That That's right. That's right. That's right. So I'm chopping up this iru right here to be able to infuse that right inside of here. And that flavor will kind of bleed its way out into the chocolate. Iru, how do you spell that? I R U. I, I mm -hmm. that. that's still the flavor is still on my Exactly. Is that good? Keep going. All right. That's why I was saying, like that that part is gonna be a beast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so while that's tempering right here, mm -hmm. I want to whenever I do like a lot of southern food or foods, you know, that are based in the American South, I always try to bring some of the route that we took from Africa, mm -hmm. you know? So the Iru represents the African part of it, mm -hmm. but I'm also going to take a mango mm -hmm. and kind of cook that down with some saffron mm -hmm. that's gonna go along with this right here. So you're gonna taste the entire journey from Africa through the Caribbean into the American South. Entire diaspora. Yeah, right. Know. All in one dish. And you don't have no old school peeler, do you? You got it right there. In my hand? That massive, yes. <laughs> yes so that is a hand forged knife. Look um, at that. Yeah, Look at that. Man, this is incredible. Now I see what you were talking about with that. It is kind of right. moving out. Exactly. Exactly. Now you want to get that pretty as thick as you can get it. Okay. You're gonna whip so much air and that sugar and the fat from the yolks is really gonna be the binder because this chocolate is gonna go inside. Gotcha. You know, I tried to make a historic um, chocolate puff recipe. Uh-huh, and what happened? What happened? They said they were chocolate discs. <laughs> 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 My arm gave away. Yeah, it's a meringue, and, and you have to get that in. Exactly. So important. Because I would think that back in the day, just like with hot water cornbread, mm -hmm. there was no baking soda, baking powder, any of that. Mm -hmm. So it was the heat from the liquid that would kind of make, that would activate your flour and your sugar into the rise that, that you were looking for. Mm -hmm. Switch hands. <laughs> I know. That's why I gave you the job, bro. <laughs> but this is a pretty fancy dish, um, seemingly. Even though it's it's so simple, it's just a few ingredients. It's so simple, but the but but the great thing about this is 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 the taste. Mm -hmm. You know, because you're gonna have that fermentation. The chocolate is really going to be able to infuse all of that. It's not going to taste like regular chocolate, mm -hmm. you know. It's going to kind of have some of that funkiness to it that that we're going to love, mm -hmm. you know. And you said funky that that iru when it first hit my house. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but so, the more that it lingered, the sweeter it got. Exactly. All right, now I'm going to go right into there, okay. and you're going to keep on going. Okay. Chef, yeah. we just met and you're torturing me already. <laughs> <laughs> this is a hard job. It is. Um, now, normally, I would do this in a KitchenAid, mm -hmm. you know, to where you really get that ribbony kind of effect to it. Mm -hmm. Because the more that your, that your sugar 
and your and and your egg combine mm -hmm. once you put that chocolate in it's really going to bind it mm -hmm. you know so i'm very curious to see how firm this is going to set up and it looks great it feels uh -huh. it feels good you know let's, let's see about your 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 cheat whisk let's see if that one don't work let's see can you show me how to use that? You see how I, did that? <laughs> I saw that coming. I saw that one coming. So here, now we can switch up. So in 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 this in, in the saute pan right here, take some of this mango okay. and hit it with some sugar. If you have any old school kind of any any kind of spirit, some wine, a little bit of whiskey, whatever, mm -hmm. that just to give it a little bit of moisture. And then we're going to infuse that saffron right into it. Some sugar, yep, 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 yep. Because I know, I know, back in the day, a lot of things that were coming through the Caribbean, they had a lot of that dark rum. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. I think all I have right here is just some vanilla. Some Do you know who had some in his pocket? Hey, Matt. Matt had a bottle in his back pocket. Uh huh. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even with the cinnamon. Yes. I love it. Is that good? Yep. And then we're gonna put some saffron threads up in there. Wow, that smells really good. That mango, that wine is in there. Now the saffron, the flavors are really coming together. I could imagine what that rum would be like. Exactly. Very spiced. Really bringing home some of that of the Caribbean. In there, you could even put a splash of, of coconut up in there too. Oh, really? You know. All right. So now we have this here. I'm going to just put a little layer of that on this plate. Even better. I'm big, so I like. It. <laughs> <laughs> that means it'll be more. And then this here, I'm going to put into the freezer okay. so it sets. Now you say freezer. I'm dressed in this 18th century clothing. I don't know what a freezer is. Uh, or if you have an ice block, okay. then I will uh, put that on top of there too. That's perfect. Man, that's, yeah. that's going to be bomb. Yeah. That's nice and wet. Oh, so not like a syrup. It's going to be okay because it's going to keep on going. Yeah. But but um, too much and it'll be like a glue. Mm -hmm. Where right here, like everything is cold, you can taste it. You have salt because we can put that balance in there. Oh man! Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Let me get you some. Time. Please. So chef, yes. I love these pewter plates. And I love these old school pewter spoons. Now, this just came out the freezer. You can see it's a little firm mm -hmm. and it's served cold. It's gonna be really nice for the mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna have the warm mango saffron sauce to go on top of that. And then I just wanna kind of finish it up real quick. I'm gonna hit this with a little bit of sea salt so that you kind of have that chocolate, salty chocolate kind of effect to it. And then I'm going to come at you with this. Boom. You got your mango, you got your saffron. I'm going to get some of that juice, like the old school song says, around the outside, around the outside. <laughs> right? Right? Did you say you wanted to put some? And then I want to hit this with some of that American heritage chocolate. Gotcha. This is so good because it's really good. That spice to it is really good. And then with this, I'm just going to hit boom, boom, boom. But extra. Mm -hmm. Chef, I'll let you get down first. Okay. However you want to eat, man, get down. It's just right. me and you. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let me see here. This is bad left hand. Oh, man. Very good. Like ganache. You look at these cameras are rolling. I'll fight you right now. <laughs> oh my God, this is so good. And every single, every single thing that we put 
put in there, you can taste the flavors. You Not can. Nothing overpowers the other. Nothing, right? It blends so perfectly, mm -hmm. you know? And, 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 and you can taste North Africa. Mm -hmm. You can taste the Caribbean. Yeah. And the U.S. Yeah. Right here in Virginia. And we'd like to thank the great people here at the Mars Chocolate for the opportunity to be able to bring you right here at the Seasons Kitchen. Listen, every single time that we do this program, we learn so much more, but we get a deeper appreciation for the sacrifices that were made by people like Caesar. Listen, we thank you so much for joining us tonight, and we look forward to the next time. Thank you. All right, Dante, you just want to unmute real quick. All right. So I'm I'm drooling. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna get my camera on here, but uh, those desserts were so good. And you weren't lying about the the one that you made, Chris. All those different flavors, they hit like specifically like your whole mouth. Like every taste bud was singing a different song, but it all came together. It was amazing. And the tart too, the texture and that spice of that American heritage was so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, also, I mean that, that's, 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 <laughs> that's, that's some of the stuff, you know, like e even, even on set, that those would be some of the ways that chefs would even communicate an idea or a flavor to each other. You know, like I would say, hey, listen, I have this idea for this chocolate dish that brings in the flavors of saffron and, you know, and the Caribbean with maybe some mango or with that or, or that. And then you just whip up like a, a small little bite or a flavor. And then once Dontavius has that in his mind and, and on his palate, then we go back and forth as far as how much further we want that dish to go or even mm. pull it back in a little, just a touch, you know. But that's I think that's why you have to come back so y'all can do some more cooking together. No doubt, no <laughs> doubt, no doubt. What was it like, Don, to have a Top Chef finalist, superstar, Chris Scott in, in Caesar's Kitchen? What was that like for you? <laughs> it was it was an amazing experience. So, you know, we've been trying to do this program for a while. Um, and so I was extremely nervous to be in the same space with um, with Chris, with Chef um, and and. I just didn't know what to expect. You know, um, whenever you work with celebrities, sometimes you have different personalities. Um, and and I, I will say that, Chef, you, you are a brother. You are indeed a brother. Anybody who would have me eat these things, <laughs> and I trusted you to eat this yeah, you food. You all the props today, man. <laughs> My man got cake and tarts and Eru and everything. Man, what else you got over there? <laughs> well, it's not a branded thing, but it's a, it's a little drink I got to wash down that that, <laughs> that chocolate, <laughs> little soda. But um, but yeah, you 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 really opened up my mind and my palate to um some different experiences, and I'm I'm so grateful. Um, but to be able to share that space, to be able to share those um experience um experiences with you, um, were just absolutely amazing. And, and to be able to kind of see how, you know, one chef learns from the other uh, puts me in, in that parallel universe to think about the relationship between Richard Minot and Caesar. You know, Richard had a skill set and that was to be able to um, provide those English dishes and all of these fancy things with chocolate um, to be able to share that down to Caesar and for Caesar to take that and, and twist it up and make it his own and make that kitchen his space. Um, I oftentimes welcome people to Caesar's Palace. You know, uh, that's kind of romanticized, but that's my way of kind of catching, capturing your mind first so that I can hit you, hit you really hard with the facts. So um, yeah, it was great sharing that space with you. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, it's alive, that space is so alive. And I hope you were able to feel that while you were in there. Oh, totally, totally. I mean, just, 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 I, I think that maybe for the first five, 10 minutes, just trying to 
really kind of cook in that colonial way in the beginning was a little difficult. But once you kind of get into the flow and understand the fire, understand the smoke, understand that heat and how to utilize that as per what it is that you were doing, it just mm -hmm. like you just slide right into it, you know, mm -hmm. and then you really are able to take in the the rich history of what that room is all about. I mean, I'm sure Caesar and his crew prepared many meals, you know, and felt a, an, an entire host of emotion while while cooking in that room. You know, I'm mm -hmm. sure that there has been so much love and so much pain and so much joy. You know, mm -hmm. working through him, his spirit, his hands, you know, mm -hmm. into the food in that room. And, and yeah. even even jokes, because his 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 owner, his master was, you know, quite the character. You know, he was mm -hmm. kind of an over the top kind of guy. Um, right. I'm sure I'm I'm almost certain that there were some some conversations that were held in that kitchen and around that big house about their owner um, him being so eclectic. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Yep. Yeah, when you're the boss, no one ever really talks nice about you all the time. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> when he comes around, yes, everything is fine. Yes. yes. Right. As soon as he leaves, mm -hmm. that's when it starts. Mm -hmm. and those walls could talk. It would be an amazing, amazing place to listen, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got a bunch of questions. I'm going to go ahead and just start shooting them out. Um, some are technical, some are more historical. So okay. we have a question here from Daphne, and she asks that um, if the if the tart can be made in a modern kitchen, if so, will the recipe be available after the program? So if you could share that, that would be awesome. And are there any adjustments that you make for that in a modern no. kitchen? Um, no, it's just that 350 degree oven is very simple. A quarter cup of um, chocolate, that American heritage chocolate, a quarter cup of flour, one cup of sugar, and two eggs to one stick of butter in a pie tin. And it is a nine inch pie tin. Um, and no, I actually nice, use a, a modern, and, and I'll share that recipe with, um, with, with, um, the team to be able to send it out with this recording, but I use a modern pie tin. Those those real ones are, are kind of tough to find, um, but I found a source. <laughs> so maybe next chocolate round we'll have those. And it was three fifty, correct? Yes, at three fifty for forty five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Chris asks, would some have made this with sweeteners other than sugar, honey, or maple syrup? And how expensive was chocolate back in the day? I mean, so, I can answer this here, or you can go for it. Molasses, molasses is a sweetener, but for the Lee family, they had access. They were, as I often tell the, the kids whenever I do programs at Stratford Hall, the Lees were filthy, stinking rich. And they had access. Y'all here, y'all are probably hear background noise. My grandma and mom are in the dining room beside me. They, I think they <laughs> forgot that I was on Zoom. Um, <laughs> They're probably eating that tart you made. <laughs> They are, they are, but they were filthy, stinking rich, and they had access to to everything that they could get their hands on, um, products, people, you know, whatever resources that they could pay for, they could get. So money wasn't an option for them, but molasses would be uh, an opportunity to sweeten it as well, and we just changed the flavor flavor profile just a little bit. And with a little bit of research, uh, um, I saw like in the 1730s. 1730s between 1730s and 1750s chocolate at one point um was about three dollars per pound um at that time so it was very 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 expensive um yeah yeah and they would cut it with with things as well so somebody also asked if it was only dark chocolate used in the 1700s and you know this the milk chocolate that we think of now as chocolate was definitely not how they were consuming okay. it back then so they would cut it with stuff like Dontavious did, but a lot of times they would put things like hot pepper and spices and different mm -hmm. things in there. And it was a bitter drink, you know, it was mostly like men drinking it in coffee shops. And there's a whole sort of culture around sipping chocolate too, which I think is really fascinating. It's like the 18th century espresso, you know, um, <laughs> never you, <laughs> that's what, that's kind of what I found it to be. Um, and that American heritage blend has those, those different aromas, those different um, flavor agents in it that actually tastes really good if you drink it as a sipping chocolate, no matter how you use it. 
So we have some questions for you, Chris. Um, Doreen asks, what liquor did you end up using in that second dish? I believe we, used port, we used port wine, right? Yeah, we did end up putting some bourbon in it as well. Right, 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 right. right. I love that y'all left me screaming at Matt. I know, that, that, I mean, was... that was so hood, but so real, you know? <laughs> so you had your hood moment. I had my hood moment with my wig. <laughs> I'm calling out people behind <laughs> the camera. No, Yo, do you Matt, cut it or not? I just let it be. <laughs> it's, this is how these programs go. <laughs> this is a real life. That, right? That's but crazy. it's real, you know, like kitchens are real spaces. And one of the things, like, for those of you that have seen our other our other shows like this, you know, what was great about the two of you is it was one shot. I mean, y'all just hit it right and then it was yeah. over. And it was like, all of a sudden it was like magic in front of our eyes. Other times we filmed these and I mean, it's like all day to get a 15 minute video. And mm. you guys had a, a, you know, sort of like this sort of charismatic chemistry happening and it was awesome, you know? So yeah, let it all, let it all be in there. I mean, those of us that have worked in professional kitchens know that, you know, the Matt comment is like, you know, pretty normal. common. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally coming normal. Out our mouth, right? Exactly. And and that's how it, like you said, that's how it was. That kitchen is really quiet when I'm in there by myself. So yeah. to have another chef in there, to have other people in there, to be able to yell at and say, hey, hand me this, hand me that, brings it to life, you know? Yep. Um, yep. When people come and visit the kitchen, I love the tour that you guys have because you could hear the way that it the, the way that it could have sounded. It puts you into that space, so it, it was loud. <laughs> what I love too is that I mean that so just for you all too that are watching in the next few months we're going to have a barbecue program on Zoom and these two men right here threw down the next day and that was a week ago and I went in there today and I could still smell the barbecue so. I'm gonna when leave it right there when it gets. And when you're watching that, make sure you peep my outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Real country. <laughs> she likes right. to call herself. <laughs> so make sure you tune in just for that part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Linda wants to know where you find um Iru. Uh, you can find it in a lot of African shops. Um, or if you want to go online, there's a nice spot called uh Kalushtans. It's a it's a it's a very specialty store here in New York City, and you can buy that little bag. I think for like seven dollars or so. But a little bit goes a long way. The Nigerians really use that to make a soup called iguzi soup, and in that will be your garlic, your ginger, some lemongrass, and then you throw in that, and then you kind of sweat all of that up right then and there. Palm oil, of course, you know. And then you can throw in either your fish stock, your beef stock, or whichever direction that you're going to go in after that. But it's mainly used as an aromatic. But when you taste it, like right away, because I'm when 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 I first started in the industry, a lot of um, pastry is still near and dear to my heart. I have a sweet tooth, yeah. so when I eat savory things, I often think about how they would taste in sweet applications. You know, so when I had that, I thought, you know what, this is going to go in chocolate and it's going to be off the hook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and it was. Oh, you it said was. Aromatic. aromatic. You said <laughs> <laughs> it has a very it was funky. smell. Yeah. But, but even in savory okay. dishes, funk is needed. Right. Mm -hmm. Funk is always needed in food. Like, I made, I made delicious food. things are my favorite things to eat. Yeah. I made chili tonight and I was like, I need a little bit more of funk. So I found some cumin and threw it over in there and that was exactly what it needed. Yep. A little go. bit of dirt. Got to throw mm -hmm. it in there. A little dirt. I love that. A little bit of dirt. Um, Chris clarified. Thank you, Chris. $3 in U.S. Um, dollars in seventeen ninety one would have been one fifty today. So that little bit of chocolate would have cost $150 today. So if you think about all the desserts that Caesar was making, again, the Lees had resources. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right, so we got a question here for you, Don, from Ken. Can you describe your cooking uniform in the 18th century? And where did cho chocolate ship from? And was hazelnut used in that time of history? Okay, so my my um, clothing is uh, representative of what would have been worn in the 18th century. So you saw the, the vest. I actually have it right here beside me because I need to wash it. I'm washing clothes today. Too, so, um, but you have the vest called a waistcoat 
And 18th century clothing fits really, really tight. And y'all see, I'm a big dude. So it's tough to find things that fit just right. But everything was tailored, was literally tailor made. So the, the waistcoat or waistcoat was the was the vest. Of course, you wear a long sleeve blouse shirt. Um, and then just the the, the head covering, uh, minus the wig cap, of course. I was trying to protect my locks. I had just got them done. Um <laughs> But you 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 put something on your head just in general because in 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 the kitchen you you definitely want to keep your head covered. But many times in the 18th century you see men wearing work caps, um, and that's just the type of work cap that you would see, or even a sleep cap. Those those the same style um, is is just that. Um, you guys saw that that nice shot of me taking the the pie out of the oven, you know, that that back shot of me, um, those pants are actually called um, breeches. So they stop at your knee and they are supposed to fit really baggy in the seat. Again, I'm a big dude and it's hard to find these clothes um, that fit just right unless you get them tailor made. So um, I have a friend, Neil Hurst, and a couple other people um, who are tailors who I'm going to get me some more pants. That way y'all can't see all of my good parts um, on the next video. <laughs> Listen, I just y'all know I like to have fun, but you know that's that's what it is. They they are supposed to fit because you have to get on a horse. You know you have to be able to move, move around. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> um, a question here as well. So, um, Chris wants to know wants you to explain how you maintain temperature in a wood fire, and that's something that you know I think both of you can speak to that a little bit. Whether you're fresh at it or if you're doing it all the time, like you, Don. So, how yeah. do you deal with the fire? How do you finesse you know delicate things prayer and supplication i did not know what i was doing that was the first time that i had ever used that 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 brick oven um justin cherry you guys have probably seen him he is a master at it and he gave me a crash course um through facebook messenger you know a couple weeks before um, I had to go up because I knew what I what I wanted to do. You have to make sure that it gets really hot um, and that it and that it stays hot. So you just have to add wood to it um, until you, you keep and maintain the temperature. Now, you have hot coals and those hot coals will help keep that residual heat in the oven. Um, what you did not see was the door. Um, and there is a door that goes to that oven, um, but we're in the process of getting a new door at um, Stratford Hall um, to be able to, to replace the one that was there. Um, but yeah, so you use that door, hot coals, more more wood. I think also, you know, a lot of a, a, a lot of practice come comes in into play. You know, mm -hmm. like you back then, they would straight up just put their hand into the oven to kind of get a feel of the hot spots of the cold spots of the mm -hmm. oven where they would lay the woods even when they're sprinkling out some of the uh, coals to other parts like you would have a colder part of the oven you would have a warmer part of the oven and you would probably move the tart or pie or bread around there as it's cooking at the same time francis mm -hmm. mallman out of out of uh i think he's in new zealand talks about all the time about how fire is life, you know, and to really understand uh, the heat aspect of it, the living aspect of it, um, the smoke aspect of it, and how to incorporate all of those into whatever it is that you're preparing. Even in the next episode when we're doing the barbecue, you know, when I took the, the leafy greens and the screen and really charred that right there in the coals, you know, and even that, like, you just have to have somewhat of the understanding of what that fire and what that soot and what that smoke and, and, and all of that is going to be able to do. So certainly it takes a lot of practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you're right. Yeah. When Justin comes to, he can bake things like he's using some fancy wolf stove, you know, and it's sitting there with some coals and that crazy brick oven. And pretty crazy. It won't right, be we one. Yeah. We're going to have a Richard Minot Caesar moment in that kitchen. I think um, it needs to happen. Yeah, because I, I have to learn how to use it properly. 
Yeah, no, that would be great. All right, we have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a great question here from Brooke. Are there any opportunities to experience the chocolate desserts that the chefs made this evening or other desserts at Stratford Hall? I think we can at least share the recipe of the tart at minimum, if not both. And then I feel like we should have some sort of tasting event next year, don't you think? Mm, let's that, do it that when it's be, warm. Let's warm, yeah. <laughs> but not too warm. We want to hit like fall or spring, fall. summertime. You don't want to be in that kitchen. <laughs> I'm a different person in the summertime in that kitchen. Trust me. <laughs> I think we all are in that space. Yeah. It is a, it or is or a you could be like one of one of our visitors at Christmas Tide a couple years ago and just visit and and break the ranks and and just steal a piece off the table. <laughs> I was like, wait, lady, what are you doing? I mean, she, you were cooking up some chicken. I <laughs> saw <laughs> Here's a question from Laura for you, Don Tavius. Does Stratford Hall have records of the Lee family purchasing vanilla? Or it's like a question for me as well. Um, or did you add it to your version of the tart for, you know, sort of purple, personal preference? So I know I, the Lees had everything you could ever imagine. So they had, if, they, if it existed, they had it in their kitchen. But Don Tavius, was that a twist that you put on there? Was it in the original recipe? No, that that arrest that recipe that I actually shared is is a Dontavious a Dontavious edition of it. So and and I'm glad that that question was asked about personal preference. I mentioned that 1737 receipt. Um, the I can't even remember the name of the 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 cookbook. Um, but I mentioned Hannah Glass with her 18th cent her 1800s recipe. What these ladies and gentlemen were doing is what we do today we and what we did with what i did with chris uh, with chef chris in the in the kitchen with his dish they looked at recipes they looked at receipts and they made them their own they would make twists and and tweaks to it and that's why you will see chocolate tart chocolate tart another way um because they added their twist to it and so the addition of more flour um, and because the original receipt actually called for, I think like three tablespoons of flour or three, yeah, like two tablespoons of flour. It was more of an egg custard and the flour was a rice flour to just act as a stabilizer. Um, but when I made it, it wasn't good. It didn't look, it didn't look right. And it just, I just said, nope, I'm going to adjust this to make it fit my need, but then also use it as a learning opportunity for you all tonight to um, to help you understand that recipes change um, because people are making them. And if the taste doesn't taste right, then fix it, make it your own. So we talk pleasure. about how, how, how you can look at recipes from back in the day as well and tell who had money and who did not. Yeah. You know, yes. I'm sure that any recipe that was coming through the Lee house, you mm -hmm. know, would have ingredients like the sugar or the vanilla or the wines and liquors and bourbons and all that. But mm -hmm. as I would say back in the day, a lot of uh, black folk didn't really have that money. And cornbread certainly is one of those recipes that regardless of where you come from, there's a family cornbread recipe in everyone's family, despite mm -hmm. where, where you come from. But then you look at it, and then if it doesn't have sugar, if it doesn't have any type of leaveners in it, you know, then probably when that was written, it was written by folks that did not have money, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I talk about recipes to anyone that I'm teaching, I always try to emphasize that, you know, tell me more about the origins of that said recipe. Did they have mm -hmm. money? Did they come from money? You can kind of tell, you know, mm -hmm. something like hot water cornbread as per, you know, cornbread with baking powder and sugar and extra eggs and all this and that, you know, it, it, it certainly makes a difference. You know, one of the things that I saw even when touring the, the uh, Lee house, when we went in the house, were, were, were the grand displays of all the, the pastries and, 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 and the full on spread of like, of the beverages and, and everything. And you know, knew that these cats had big money and did not care to, you know, how much they spent, you know, they mm -hmm. wanted what they wanted, you know, and that was kind of cool for, for Caesar as well, because even when you and I were talking that day, Dontavious, talking about how how much influence that 
or, or inspiration that Caesar was probably experimenting with as he's tasting these new ingredients at the mm -hmm. same time. You know what I mean? Like he's trying new new things that are just coming into that kitchen, being trained up by this guy, but mm -hmm. also throwing his own skill, his own background into that and turning it into something beautiful. You called it something so wonderful, and I used it all weekend, a cultural collision. Mm. You, mm -hmm. you, 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 you mentioned that, and, and that has stuck with me, and I'm going to always use that moving forward because that's exactly what it was. Right. Um, you mentioned the cornbread today. It's crazy with the chili. Of course, we had cornbread. Yeah. Um, but I, my mom, I was talking to my mom on the phone, just a quick story, I was talking to her on the phone today. I was like, you should come down and have this chili. I was inviting her to have chili, but I really was inviting her so that she could come and make the cornbread. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> so she was like, well, mother can make it. Talking about my grandmother. I was like, well, you make cornbread better than her. She's like, I hope she heard you say that, but she just heard me say it. <laughs> Look, <and> she said, <laughs> my grandma said, you sure? I sure did. <laughs> Look at that, he crazy. <laughs> But the thing is, my mom makes cornbread that tastes just like my grandfather's cornbread. Mm. He's, been, he's been gone since 2014. And I appreciate the outfit that you had on for the for the next program because mm. it was a nod. It was a nod to him. And I felt like he was in the kitchen with us watching oh, seeing your 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 outfit. But um it was a, a true to have her make this cornbread today, and I can't wait until we're done. Not to rush y'all off, but um, it looks it it looked like it's so good. I can't wait to get it because it's eggy, <laughs> it's sweet, and it yep. it just it's just right. Yep. It's got yep. a little crack in the top, so you know she put a lot of butter and stuff in it. Mm -hmm. oh, it's gonna be good. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. <laughs> Y'all are making me hungry. Oh my yeah. goodness. All right. Any more questions? We got one. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that we can wrap it up. There's no more questions. I do just want to take a moment and just thank you both. And, you know, especially Dontavius for the long storytelling that you've done for Caesar and his honor. Um, and of course, <laughs> uh, Chef Chris Scott for coming down and making the trip down from New York to come to you know, one of your ancestral lands in this part of Virginia down here. I thought that was a really interesting moment when I realized that your your family on your father's side is from nearby Stratford. So I think there's moments like this when, you know, people come together and there's just this sort of chemistry that happens and it's it's all around storytelling and honoring the ancestors. And I think that you both do it beautifully. I loved watching the dynamic between the two of you. And when you all come back in a couple of months and watch that barbecue program. You'll see some more of their dynamic together. But, you know, just honoring Caesar and, and the enslaved folks here, not just by talking about the, the horror of their life and the pain and the all of the, that part of their life, but also talking about who they were as people. You know, what did they take joy in? Who What did they create um, in the bonds of enslavement? I think it's those kinds of conversations that help bring dignity to their beings, to their history, to their legacy. And you all did that beautifully with this. I want to thank you both for what you did. Thank you, Kelly. And it does not water just because we don't talk about the degradation and the, all the bad, horrible things that does not water down the history. It does not whitewash the history. What it does is it, it, it strengthens it. You know, Chris said something while we were while we were in the kitchen, because I was like, he didn't have access to this. He couldn't eat this. But the correction came. You can't be in a kitchen cooking and not taste the food. Right. He wasn't taking the stuff home to his family, you know. But then at the same time, there was a level of power that Caesar had in that kitchen, because the kitchen is the heartbeat of any home, whether you use it or not. You know, food is you have you need it. So um, I, I don't want people to think that just because we didn't talk about lashings and beatings and running away and all of this stuff that that we're whitewashing the, the history, because that's not the case. Um, it strengthens it to be able to, to talk about the other nuances and the other side of history. I said um, at, at Christmas Tide that it's my job and our job as historians to amplify the voices of the ancestors. And this just kind of slipped out on accident, but it hit me. When I become an ancestor, I want someone to amplify my voice without changing the narrative. So that's, that's why I do what I do, um, is to amplify their voices 
not to change it. That was beautiful. Well, thank you both so much. And thank you all for zooming in and please stay tuned for our next food program, which will be sometime in the spring uh, once we get some more uh, edits done and get that on the schedule. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful holiday season. And please, please uh, continue to support our programs. We love having these and it's wonderful to have people like the two of you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, come to Stratford and share your love and passion for food and history. So thank you all and have a good night. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, guys. Yeah. It's time. Thank you, everyone. Take care.